Hello, um, thank you for joining us. My name is Annabelle Cellini. I'm Chief Strategy Officer at ASA, and I'm delighted to be here um, with our uh, friend and partner, uh, Matt Siegelman, the CEO of Burning Glass Technologies. Um, we are going to jump into some slides in a minute, but I just thought I'd take a second to um, let you know why we're here. Um, back before COVID, um, ASA was having a conversation with Burning Glass Technologies. Um, as we started to explore um, the future of 2030 um, for kids in middle school today. Um, and so that is what we're going to cover in the session today. Tell you a little bit about ASA. Um, ASA, at ASA, our mission is to help young people know themselves, know their options, and make informed choices about their career and education goals. Uh, we do that through helping um, young people starting in middle school explore career options, uh, experiment through uh, work-based learning and apprenticeships, um, through to execution and making successful post-secondary transitions into um, all of the options that are available to them. And so what we felt was, um, coming into this research, the group that we're serving right now, today's middle schoolers and high schoolers, will be emerging into this world of work in 2030. Uh, and we wanted to understand what that world was going to look like for them and how best to prepare them for it. And it's hard, as Matt will uh, no doubt share, um, to be able to forecast what those jobs are actually going to be. But working with Burning Glass, we do have a pretty good sense of what the skills are that employers will be looking for. Um, five years ago, my work was rooted in the higher ed to uh, employment space. And we often cited the statistics that only 11% of CEOs agreed that the graduates had necessary skills to succeed in the workplace. As only uh, a small percentage of high school grads, 40% actually choose a college pathway, the question that we asked ourselves at ASA is shouldn't we be looking earlier and giving access to all kids those kinds of foundational skills that will make them successful in the workforce? So in partnership with Burning Glass, uh, we started asking educators and administrators in the K-12 system about their attitudes and importance to new foundational skills. And so Matt, um, tell us a little more about Burning Glass Technologies and we'll launch into the slides. Absolutely, and Annabelle, so great to be together, uh, to be with you today and, and so, Glad to have partnered together on this really important work. Um, you mentioned a minute ago how important it is that we be able to see forward to understanding the skills of the future. And um, that's core to uh, to Burning Glass's work. And we're lucky to have a unique perspective on that question. Burning Glass brings a big data approach to um, understanding the landscape of opportunity for students. Uh, and we do that by um, analyzing uh, you know, millions of, of jobs every day. And that allows us to map the skills that essentially form the genome of the job market. What skills are in demand, which skills are changing, which skills unlock careers and drive mobility. We work with hundreds of education institutions to help them develop programs that are aligned to, career, to, make, to careers, to help them make sure that they are building the right sets of skills and to help them uh, identify the right sets of opportunities to uh, to grow their enrollment, but also to ensure that our students are launching into successful careers and have the ability to continue to acquire skills over time. Um, and so excited to for this conversation. Fantastic. So let me just share. Um, here we go. Um, what we're talking about today, which are these new foundational skills of the modern economy. And Matt, it'd be fantastic if we can just sort of start with what are new foundational skills and how do you identify uh, their importance? So we analyzed our database of over a billion job postings to understand what employers are asking for, um, what they view as important. Um, and also how that's been changing in the new economy. Now that's really important um, in a different frame from the one we're used to using um, in the world of education where we build everything around students. It's what we do, it's what we should do. But at the end, same time, if we understand that education for our students is a bridge to opportunity, we also have to understand that landscape of opportunity. And so by studying this, um, this enormous database that describes where those opportunities are and what they're about, um, it gave us a sense for what are the skills that unlock those opportunities. Now, 
there's a lot of talk out there about the demand for all sorts of emerging technologies and AI and robotics and the like. But what we found was that at the core, there are 12 skills that unlock opportunity across every sector, across every occupation, across pretty much every level of educational team. And so specifically what we look for were skills that are in demand across domains that are associated with high value jobs, the kind of jobs we want students to be able to get um, and that will give them mobility over time. And that are in demand both at this, the BA level and at the sub BA level. Um, and also where the majority of jobs in those fields ask for them. Now, you would think that that would say there's, there's very few skills that look like that, but um, we came up with these sets of skills that unlock opportunity. Now, we weren't surprised to find that a number of the skills that met that threshold were human skills, um, the kind of the bedrocks of American um, academic education. But we also found that most jobs increasingly, and most good jobs in particular, increasingly demand sets of digital skills and business skills as well. So one of the things that's clear is employers are asking for these skills and um, you know, our graduates, uh, whether that be out of high school or out of college, are not actually being able to demonstrate that they have them. Um, I guess as an organization, a nonprofit that's squarely focused on this middle high school space, can middle and high school systems help close the gap? And if they can, what do educators think about that? So uh, I do think that that they can. Um, it's um, uh, you know these are skills that that are not anathema to education, but really actually have to be an integral part to how students are integrate uh, are are educated. We um, we all too often have a view that this is an either or instead of a both and. Um, and the reality is is that each of these sets of skills is. Um, you know, is key to unlocking millions of jobs a year, significant salary premiums, um, significant growth. So, um, you know, I look at this, uh, this page that you're showing, and, and you know, a couple of things I think are worth calling out. First of all, what we've mapped here is, um, you know, kind of how uh, the perception of, of, of educators. Um, at, and so we mapped those, those dozen skills that we just talked about a minute ago and found that, um, you know, uh, how, to what extent do educators recognize that these are, skills are essential? Now, first of all, overall, um, you know, I think it was encouraging to see that um, educators do understand that these are important. Um, we were not surprised here again to see that human skills uh, were perceived as being essential, in fact, um, yeah, I'm reminded of my grandmother's uh, comment when I used to come home with a test and if I got a 98 in the test, she'd say, what happened to the other two points? Um, it does, uh, I do wonder if, uh, you know, what, which educators are the ones who are saying that human skills are not essential. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, uh, at the same time, it is worth noting here that the percentage of, of educators who saw that digital skills in an increasingly digital era uh, only about two thirds of educators. That's, that's the majority, but still, there's a third of educators who don't even see this as as being critical. And these business enabler skills, the skills that are key to helping students navigate the world of work, um, fewer than half of of teachers um, felt that those were essential. So, um, so that was um, I think there's a perceptual gap um, that an awareness gap um, that we need to bridge here. Yeah, and we, we actually went back with you because we launched this survey, as I mentioned um, earlier in the year, we went back and actually wanted to look at this to see if perceptions had changed as a result of COVID-19. Um, perhaps unsurprisingly, um, this digital piece leapt up. Any, anything strike you as surprising or not about that? You know, uh, that um, uh, doesn't surprise me at all. I think, you know, look, we're, we're all, um, forced now to live in, in a significantly remote world. Um, and I think it's also, uh, I think uh, uh, there's been a growing awareness of the kind of implications of the future of work. A lot of us have been talking about the potential for technology to accelerate automation um, and the like, but also 
um, the reasons that, uh, and, and, and therefore why people need to have those skills to navigate. So not surprising at all to yeah. see the change in perception. Yeah. So this is very promising. This is very exciting. Educators are uh, on board with the importance of this thing uh, and, and making sure that we are um, hopefully uh, getting our kids uh, engaged early in developing these skills. Um, but uh, moving on here, I think one of the things that um, surprised us and was illuminating and I think actually creates an enormous opportunity for all of us in this space um, is that there's actually a gap between the importance of these skills being taught and and how they are being taught. Yeah, um, we, we refer to that gap as an opportunity gap. Mm. It's the difference between the percentage of educators who say that a skill is essential for their students to learn and the percentage saying that it's taught well in their schools. Um, and so um, it's, uh, it's a terrifying notion, the idea that educators know that this is important. They know that these are skills that are critical for students, uh, but um, don't have the resources, um, don't have necessarily the training or the life the, the, or the time in their curriculum to make this happen. Uh, essentially, if, um, so one of the things that's striking here as well is that we see the greatest opportunity gap around these human skills. Yeah. Uh, where, again, 80% of teachers, what happened to the other 20 points, uh, are viewing these as, uh, as, as essential and uh, uh, fewer than 40% of teachers saying that this is being taught well in their, their classrooms. Um, but those gaps have accrue across both the digital blocks, the digital train, uh, the digital building blocks, and also the business enabling skills um, as well, uh, which are equally critical to success. And talk to us a little bit about what's happening on the right hand side of the screen, because um, it seems that opportunity gaps are not created equal either. Yes, um, unfortunately not, and, and again, a, um, a, uh, a horrifying um, discovery here is, you know, research concludes that, that students in classrooms that are majority Black, um, majority Latinx face an opportunity gap um, for digital and business skills. It's actually twice the size of that for their peers in majority white classrooms. Uh, the gaps are nearly as large for students, uh, and, and that's you know, twice as much for blacks, uh, for black students, uh, black classrooms, uh, close to that for Latinx. These, um, you know, I think there's a couple of things at play here when we try to think about what is driving these larger gaps. Um, first, I think, you know, this mirrors exactly to your point, Annabelle, the, the traditional equity divides in education, uh, where we see fewer, um, uh, you know, fewer educators in schools that are majority black or majority Latinx, um, who claim that these skills are being taught well, who realize that they're under-resourced, who don't have the time, uh, don't have the capacity. Um, with digital building blocks specifically, these schools are, um, you feel that resource constraint. Um, they don't have computer labs. They don't necessarily have the after-school programs that wealthier school districts have. But the second phenomenon here is that educators in these schools actually tend to value digital and business skills more than their colleagues yeah. which the majority white schools or classrooms. And uh, that's uh, a really interesting discovery. I think, you know, for students who, for teachers who are working with um, disadvantaged students, uh, in a lot of cases, they see even more starkly that this is the ticket to ride. Um, so on the positive side, I mean, I was, I was impressed with how self-aware educators are. Um, that openness about what's not working and where new resources needed is gonna be key to making meaningful change. Absolutely, and it's exciting too because we've certainly found in our work that um, you know building a coalition of the willing and finding partners in school systems who really want this for their kids is one of the most effective ways of driving change. That's fantastic. And we will talk at the end about some of those um, specific recommendations that we would love to see um, happening to address some of these issues. Um, so faced with all of this, how possible is it? And what are the what, how do teachers feel about whether they themselves can take this on and actually start to address this opportunity gap that you've identified? 
so that was uh, another thing that was very encouraging when we discovered. Um, overall, educators do believe that that they can uh, they can move forward and incorporate these into curriculum. Um, there's tremendous pressure placed on teachers and, and administrators, administrators, but um, nonetheless, they really do believe that they can make this work, um, and that's in part because these skills can complement existing curricula. Uh, we asked teachers to explain what support they would need, and they frequently reference support from administrators in, in getting more creative about approaching mandated curricula. You need to have that kind of flexibility. Um, because an overwhelming majority of school administrators believe that the new foundational skills can and should be implemented, they should be natural champions for these skills within the school. Fantastic. And I suppose this is a question to myself as much as to you, but I will answer it as well. Um, what changes might we envision um, to expand education and, and, and also figuring out how we're doing in this space over time um, in middle and high schools? So um, a couple of quick thoughts. Um, first, you know, we, we work closely in this partnership with ASA to identify the strategies, um, especially where those strategies are informed by data. Um, and in an effort to provide some initial ideas to middle and high school educators about their options, we mapped out the skills and the sequence in which they should be taught in future curricula based on the principle that skills that are most widely applicable across the workforce should be taught first, so that no matter where students, uh, how far they get into their education, they've got marketable uh, um, uh, uh, skills that they can leverage in, in their work life. We recommend focusing on the big three human skills in middle school, communication, collaboration, critical thinking. Middle schools that can introduce analytical skills, um, I think is even better. That's, you know, they're wide demand across half of all occupations. And then I think as you start to proceed into middle and high school curricula, then you also need to start to have frameworks for doing this more successfully. Um, that's traditional testing, it's benchmarks, it's professional development for teachers, um, but it's also getting, as you said before, more creative. Yeah, no, we're excited about, and we will be talking about um, in our office hours later, some of our policy recommendations. Matt, I know you've got some office hours coming up um, and I'm sure you'd be willing to talk about it. I mean, we've, we've looked at things like um, developing standards, um, for teaching and learning those skills, certainly the measurement, you know, the, the idea that you could integrate some of this into some kind of assessment, certainly the idea that these skills get integrated in, into the curriculum. As I mentioned at the top, at ASA, we are supporting a lot of work-based learning and um, internships. We think those are fantastic ways, certainly for older kids in high school, um, to be able to gain some of these skills and experiences. Um, we see professional development. Um, so support, how do we support the teachers in, in integrating and embedding these skills um, in their programs as being a potential huge win? Um, so um, I think there's lots of work to be done here. I think there's also tons of opportunity for innovation in the ecosystem around products and services potentially to support um, this work as well. So I hope this is the beginning of a conversation and something that we can actually measure our success of over time. Um, Matt, thank you very much for joining us. Anything that you want to leave us with before you wrap up here? No, I, I think, you know, the, um, it's just so excited to partner together. Um, so excited to um, drive the awareness of what these new foundational skills are, how they can unlock opportunity and mobility for students, um, and the opportunity for, uh, for educators to integrate these into what they do every day. Um, there's real challenges here, real opportunity gaps, but at the same time, real opportunities to move forward. Wonderful. Thank you, Matt. Thank you so much, Annabelle.